Welcome everyone to this uh, to this session. Um, architecturally evident spring applications with um, J molecules. My name is Oliver Drotbom. I work for VMware in the spring team. Have done this for uh, 13 years right now. Um, I've led the spring data projects for most of the time, almost a decade. So if you've ever used anything like the CROD repository or the repository abstraction in general, that's been the work of the team and uh, me over the last a decade. Uh, I've recently moved on into, I'm still working on the team, but I'm also working uh, on some more architecturally related stuff. Um, there's a Spring Modulith project that you might have heard about that's pretty new and pretty fresh. Um, that's dealing with architectural concerns about application modularity. Um, in this talk, I would like to give you an insight in, into some integration that we have in um, or with some library called uh, J Molecules and how that allows you to like write better code for whatever for whatever that means. We're going to explore that in a, in a bit. So um, if you're interested in further resources, so that to get that out of the way, there's a t uh, there's a paper that we wrote uh, for last year's VMware internal conference um, um, on that on that topic. So if you're into the scientific aspect of it. That's a, a good resource to explore, and there's also a book coming, hopefully, by the end of uh, this year, right? That's kind of combining both the stuff that I'm doing on Spring Modulith and the stuff that you see here today. So I want to start with uh, this, basically. So who in this room wants to build evolvable software? Right? I put it on here. Like, everyone who's, who just didn't raise their arms, get out. <laughs> No, I'm just I'm just kidding, right? So I'm starting on that on that premise, and but why is that? Why do we want to do that, right? Because I see a lot of folks, um, and also like a lot of technology advertisement these days is focusing on that part, right? So how to build a REST web service quickly, but it's a it's a matter of fact that you like as soon as we have started and created a bit of code, we're actually in that next phase, right? And that's where we're spending most of the time on. So I guess most of you are spending the time modifying existing code, adding new features, refactoring code, and what have you, right? So I was kind of interested into like what enables code to be modified, right? To be uh, maintained and evolved um, easily. Um, and there's two aspects to that. I did a, quite a lot of research for the for the book primarily, um, and it all starts with actually being able to understand the code that you're looking at. Right? If you're coming new to a team and uh, you get the task to implement like a feature, then you first of all have to understand the stuff that you're looking at. Right? There's a lot of literature on um, on that topic. Uh, one of the books that I can recommend is The Programmer's Brain by, uh, Brain by Feline Hermans or Carola Lilienthal's Sustainable Software Architecture. Um, they describe certain pattern or certain like activities that you can you that you can apply to like write better and more understandable code. And one of the aspects that in particular Carola points out is the use of pattern languages within the code. Uh, when I say pattern languages, the often folks immediately think about the Gang of Four pattern, but it's actually m a more general concept, right? You have things like the domain-driven design, uh, tactical building blocks like entities, aggregates, value objects. Uh, these are patterns that we can find in our code um, that help us understand it uh, more easily, right? Um, yeah, so you, you probably already, when I said aggregate or value object, you already kind of associate some traits that you would expect uh, Quote to follow if you realize, okay, email address is a value object, then you know it's got to be immutable and what have you. Right? So if we have that, so that's something we're going to to look at how we can actually achieve that understandabil understandability and how we can build write code in a way that it's easier to understand. We're going to explore that in a bit and how J Molecules helps us with that. Uh, the next step, of course, is being able to evolve the system then in the first place. So if I if I got a picture, if I understand what I'm looking at then uh, I want my code to be evolvable in a sense that I can change it at one point and not, it not breaking apart at some completely random other point. Okay? So that's kind of the, the stuff that, in, uh, in this case, um, the Spring Modulus project is kind of uh, looking at mostly. Right? But 
Uh, that's the two, the two aspects, understandabil understandability and evolvability. So the talk title says, Architecturally Evident Code. And actually, when I, um, when I just posted, I think an hour ago, that this talk is going to happen, and if you're interested, come by, uh, someone was, was immediately replying, what does that even mean? Right? So what is architecturally evident code? And it's not a term that I've invented or a concept that I've invented. Um, again, if you, when I did the research for the book, it was kind of like, okay, you, you're, if you're thinking about like architecture and how to, to express that in software, you're pretty immediately at uh, a guy named uh, Simon Brown. Right? So you've probably heard of him for his uh, C4 component model. And then he ha has like references to a guy uh, called George Fairbanks. So he's, he's quoting him quite a lot. There's a, an interesting book, uh, Just Enough Software Architecture. It's just a, just a great title for a book, I think, because that's what we want, right? Just enough of everything. Um, and he, uh, in turn, then quotes, that's kind of a rabbit hole that you go down there, um, a paper by um, Eden and Kazman that um, explores how you can, um, how different design elements that we use in, in our architectural definitions, in our dif design definitions, can be qualified or can be classified in the first place. And that classification uh, allows some, some, or us to derive some means to actually transfer those concepts into code. Sounds all pretty weak. Let's go ahead. So they classify, or they, they, they um, yeah, separate this into basically two different groups. One is extensional elements. Sounds like crazy, but it's basically designing or, or defining things by naming, by enumerating them. My system has an consists of an order system, of an inventory system, of a shipment system, or what have you, right? So you n enumerate the things that something consists of. Um, so you immediately think of components or modules of your system that you would basically describe that way. And the way to actually translate that into the physical, if there's such a, such a thing as physical in, in software, uh, into physical artifacts or concepts in our programming world is quite straightforward, right? So we can, I mean, straightforward in, in, a, in a conceptual sense. I'm not saying that it's easy to just by saying, oh, I have an inventory system and an order system that we immediately know, do we want to build two systems or do we want to have it or to one, do we want to be, uh, it to be two build modules or different packages? Um, that's not what I'm saying. It's just that there is a way of translating um, those concepts into our code and make them make them visible, make them evident, right? In our in our code base. Uh, that's the second and then slightly um, finer granular thing is just terms of the domain language. I guess we've all started, or you've all. Um, you all name your classes after the domain concepts that you face or the, the, in, the, in the problem that you're trying to solve, right? That's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of like customer engagements which I'm involved in that could benefit from a bit more of this, right? So there are a lot, often uh, developers think in very technical terms, but um, that's just fundamentally the, the, the idea, right? So if you think about Domain-driven design and value types. This is basically what you what you find here, right? The email addresses and zip codes and whatnot. So instead of carrying around an email address as a, as a string or something like that. So again, there's a pretty direct projection from the conceptual world into the programming world that we that we have established to some degree, right? Um, so that's the extensional um, uh, elements of our architecture and design uh, space. And then there is the intentional elements. Um, they are described by concept and rules. So you, you basically define a concept, a logical concept, something like a value object or an aggregate. And then there's rules applied to these, to these um, uh, concepts. If you, uh, who of you has read um, the Implementing Domain Driven Design book, the red one by Vaughan? Right, so it's basically that in DDD there's the blue book, that's the kind of the, uh, the Old Testament, right? Uh, I'm just kidding here. Uh, so it's kind of the, the, the original book by Eric, and then Vaughan Vernon uh, came up with the, with the, um, uh, the red book, um, New Testament. Now, um, that's more focusing on implementation details, and he gives very good and concrete advice on how to structure your software if you want to follow the, for example, the DDD pattern language of value objects, entities, and aggregates. And one such rule, for example, we don't have to go into the details of that because 
they don't matter at this, uh, at this point here, is that aggregates must not refer to each other via complete object references. You only must refer to an, uh, to an uh, aggregate via its identifier. Right? So that's kind of rules that are attached to the concepts. Um, and that we would like to maybe verify in our code base, but for that, we actually need to be able to express the concept in our code base, right? And then, I mean, what, what could you do here? Um, you could come up with like naming classes in a certain way, but it's actually, it, that kind of contradicts the thing that I uh, mentioned um, on the top here, right? If I, if I um, have a concept email address, I want to name the class email address and not email address value object, which is, I mean, naming a class object is a bit of a weird thing in the first place, but um, that's kind of, okay, what do we do, right? Um, the same applies to, let's say, slightly higher level concepts. If you look at these um, the um, very popular architectures, dash architectures these days, hexagonal architecture, onion architecture, what have you, you know, they introduce concepts like ports and adapters and rings and um, yeah, and, and attach rules to them, right? Like a dependency directions that are allowed and what have you. So we're a bit stuck there. So if we want to um, express these architectural concepts in code, that's kind of a challenge. I mean, that's, it's not that like, not people have tried it, but there's no really, uh, nothing really sound yet. So I've been discussing this um, stuff with a lot of like-minded like folks at conferences, and at some point we thought, okay, what if there were Java or language-specific means to express these concepts? In Java, meaning okay, we need some Java constructs that we could use to actually to actually do that. And then one of the um, coworkers was immediately, ah, we don't have to constrain this to Java, right? We could have we could do uh, other stuff. So there's a an organi GitHub organization now called X Molecules, um, which has support to express um, architectural concepts in different programming languages. As we're at the Java conference, and I'm primarily involved in the Java port, uh, port of that. Uh, we're going to talk about J molecules now, right? So what is in there? So it's essentially a um, collection of uh, interfaces and annotations that you can use to do exactly what I just suggested, right? Describe architectural and design concepts in your code base. You can assign roles to your classes, to your code, um, using these annotations. So there's support for um, higher level um, DDD concepts like bounded contexts, uh, modules, and what have you. Um, the uh, a couple of technical patterns like the repositories and aggregates and whatnot, uh, events, and um, we also have support for uh, the architectural styles. Uh, there's also ports and adapters have been added recently, and also CQS um, annotations. So. I would like to concentrate on um, the uh, tactical patterns for this talk to basically give you an idea of how this, how this works. And also we're going to have a look at what Spring or Spring Boot can actually do with that information, with that extra work that you, that you apply here. All right. So let's have a look at the, a pretty simple um, entity arrangement. Um, I don't think you need too much of uh, DDD knowledge here to follow along, but we basically have um, two different aggregates modeled here, like an order with uh, a couple of line items. Um, the order is actually, conceptually, it's called the aggregate root, so it's an entity as well, but it's kind of the entry point into, some, into the aggregate and kind of governs the, the business rules, let's say a minimum total order amount that we need to establish for an order to be valid, right? And that order belongs to a customer, which, is situated in the in the in the different the different module the customers module so it might be a different package or a different build module doesn't matter so um, and what uh, the, the the design decision here or the code decision uh, that I've done where we, we there we are is that there is a reference that is um, to the customer object in its entirety right so that's kind of the I've already mentioned that that's that's a considered a, a design smell or a problem in 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 uh, DDD basically or in the suggested implementation of DDD. So we have our concepts. We have those concepts applied already, right? So there's an aggregate applied in our model in our like design. 
Um, and we have these rules. And these rules basically um, tell us what I just told you, um, that mapping the customer relationship as a full object is wrong, quote unquote. So let's have a look. So for a start, um, we want to start with, with explicit concepts in our code base. So if to, to actually implement that scenario and be able to verify those relationships, we need to start with that, right? We need to make the, these concepts that we have signed in our UML model uh, in our code base. So we do that by just adding a, um, a tiny library to our uh, Maven dependencies um, called jmolecules. Uh, dash DDD. It consists of, uh, so the Gmolecules project is a set of libraries. So you basically pick and choose like which architecture style you're using. Do you want to use DDD or not? Do you want to use events or what have you? Um, and you just add the library to your class path and it consists, in this case, the uh, DDD um, one um, ships with both annotations and interfaces that allow you to express these, these concepts. Right? So uh, let's take our our simple, quote unquote, <laughs> JPA mapped order class here, right? So that's, that would be a, a representation of, or basically an implementation of the model that we've just seen using the um, persistent model approach, right? So we're going to go into that in a second, but this is, we have a model class and we directly map it to JPA. No, uh, no judgment here. Yeah, right. So uh, we, we're going to get into that. So there's alternative approaches that, that I would like to, or that's what I would like to point out. It's just that this is the, the way that I see most projects do it, whether that's a good idea or not, to be debated. What's, um, what's missing here is that, I mean, we have basically lost the role assignment, right? So there's no way for us to tell that order is an aggregate root in the first place. We can only uh, find out, I mean, if, we, if we're not using uh, J-molecules, uh, we would probably skim the rest of our code base for something like an order repository, which we would might find. And from the combination of the two, from the presence of the two types, we could kind of um, defer that order is an aggregate root, while line item is not, because there's no repository for line item. Right? That's kind of uh, a bit of a de 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 detail here, but that's kind of the way that we would deduce that, okay, order is an aggregate root. So what we're missing here is this conceptual gravity, as I usually describe it, right? We look at the class and we don't really, we're not able to defer the role it has in the, in the code base. It's an entity, okay, but it doesn't mean that it's, it's an aggregate. So what we can do, and it's, I mean, it's pretty simple and straightforward, is um, use, in this case, the type-based, um, uh, the type-based um, abstractions, so interfaces in this case, from the jmolecules uh, library. So org jmolecules ddd types aggregate root. And um, the types or the interface-based uh, um, flavor allows us to use generics to already constrain the, um, the relationships that we can define between, uh, between the elements. So in this case, um, where am I here? Uh, order ID, the, the second parameter, is constrained to be uh, a type that implements identifier. So there's some kind of viral element to the declaration here because we need now need order ID to actually implement the identifier interface uh, to be able, or for us to be able to declare that up here. Right? So that sounds rather boring to me. Right? Oh wow, if we just added two interfaces. so. What do we get from that, right? So the first thing is that we get, we can uh, verify our arrangement. We could architectural verification or design verification in this case in the, in the DDD space. So what this enables us, the usage of these annotations enables tool vendors and third parties and framework implementers, going to get to that in a, in a bit, uh, to actually refer to these interfaces and annotations and basically build the verification infrastructure, pre-build the verification infrastructure. If you've ever used something like ArcUnit, who knows what ArcUnit does? It's a, it's a Java library in which you can write Java code where you basically tell ArcUnit how to identify concepts like these in the first place and then establish rules. For example, okay, um, if something is annotated or is, implements the aggregate root interface, then something is considered an aggregate, and for all aggregates, there's a rule that says yada, 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 
right? You can write this down. But without something like J-Molecules, you would have to establish these rules and concepts again and again. I mean, you could, could copy them from project to project, but we can actually prepare that. And there's also um, um, another project, a similar or similarly minded project called JQ Assistant um, that is like similar to ArcUnit, but does it applies these verifications in a in a different way? Um, um, in this case, it's integrated in the build, and um, you would like scan and analyze the your code base. And what you put in here is a pre-built JQ Assistant uh, J Molecules plugin, and that has all the rules and concept definitions already built in. Right? Um, in ArcUnit, it looks similar uh, and slightly simpler, even. Right? Um, J the JQ Assistant tool it can do quite a lot more than th than just uh, that. It can analyze your Git commits and correlate them to some quality attributes or what have you. So it's kind of a sophisticated one. If you only want to check the J Molecules rules, then uh, something like this would be sufficient, right? So you just start an the or start ArcUnit, the, the JUnit 5 integration of ArcUnit, basically point it to your Spring Boot application, and then there is a an Arc test a property in which you just uh, use the predefined class, uh, class and say jmolecules ddd rules all in this case right so there's a like for all the relationships uh, entities being allowed to refer to value objects but value objects not being allowed to refer to entities all these kinds of rules are in there you can also um, use them one by one individually if you want to be more selective about them but that's kind of um, the idea right so you all you simply express or assign these roles to your types, and then uh, get these verification rules, uh, both for like the DDD stuff. But if you're, for example, using the, let's say, hexagonal architecture uh, annotations, you get something like port and adapter, and uh, the verification will make sure that the the um, the, the dependencies are kind of um, adhered to, right? The allowed dependencies are adhered to. So that's interesting and nice, um, but there's more we can do. Um, I've already shown you the um, Java, the Java implementation class of um, of the order. So that was the the style that basically uh, approaches this by saying, okay, here's my model class, um, and I use JPA annotations to describe how my JPA entity manager is supposed to map that model class onto tables. Um, if you discuss this with uh, DDD folks, that's a huge, that's an approach that's usually frowned upon, because um, you want to, uh, or the idea is that you want to, you want your domain model to be um, free of the forces of technology, right? I mean, the annotations are one thing, but there's also a, a quite a few implicit um, uh, yeah, design constraints that you get from using JPA. Um, we're going to go to into that in a second. Uh, there's another approach, uh, the dedicated persistence model, so uh, in which you would just model your domain independently of the um, of any kind of persistence technology, and then your repository layer would be responsible to map that onto whatever target model, persistence target model uh, you would would have uh, would have there, right? Um, I don't want to like position myself like into which of the two is better. I think there's a like you can take a pragmatic view on this and argue that okay if that mapping becomes too complex then that's kind of a problem in itself and especially with newer applications written if you control the table structure and if it's fine for you to change a column name alongside a property by using a flyway migration script or what have you then there's nothing wrong inherently wrong in, in the left approach, if you have to integrate with an existing um, database, right, then I'd probably rather resort to the to the right side uh, of of the of the idea here. Um, coming back to the criticism that folks have with the left approach, when I say, okay, I think it's it's okay to do that, um, then we're still with left with this mess, right? So, and this is kind of I totally accept the argument that is like, okay, I mean, this is annotation hell to some degree and it is like annotation hell to as as a cure to some degree right because otherwise we would need to have like a couple of um, constructors defined which make would make the m even or produce even more boilerplate right um, so 
there's a couple of things to consider here from a JPA mapping point of view that are, or that that kind of are constituting that 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 downs or these downsides, right? So for one, um, remember we've we have our our model in um, that we've designed um, in the first place that already had uh, stereotypes, the stereotypes assigned to the class. Um, so we know we know that order is an aggregate, and um, we know that order ID is actually an identifier. Um, so we still have to tell JPA, hmm, this is an identifier, right? That feels a bit weird. So we also know that order is an aggregate root, so it's an entity implicitly. So we still have to have an at and JPA at entity on here to get JPA to work. So there's that, and there's also a couple of other things, um, not only annotations, but um, in this case uh, here, the noargs constructor that we need. We need to implement serializable with our identifier, thanks to some constraints in some popular um, JPA implementations. Um, that's all stuff that we actually don't want to see in our in a in a real domain model, and that's the reason why like people concerned about this criticize this approach, and right right they do so rightfully, right? So that's the idea. But what if we could get rid of this stuff and still persist that class via JPA, right? Um, yeah, I so said that's like an, another aspect, like this this one too many and cascade type all is actually if you follow the DDD guidelines about like aggregates, it's actually the only reasonable way to map a collection property, really. So there's a lot of defaults that we could kind of derive from the fact that these types actually adhere to a certain stereotype. So what can we do about uh, this problem here? Um, there is integration um, that follows or that floats basically follows the the DDD annotations. So we have we've had that jar already, right? And what we can do is we can um, add some uh, the byte, Maven byte buddy plugin into our um, into our uh, build, basically, and register the J molecules byte buddy plugin. I mean, it's a, a plugin into a plugin. We're kind of getting it's turtles all the way down, right? Yeah. Uh, so you have the Maven byte buddy plugin, and that plugin is extended by the J molecules byte buddy plugin. Um, that contains code that works similar to what um, Spring Boot actually does, right? So, or let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Byte buddy is a library uh, that can augment Java code. It can actually do byte code manipulation. It allows you to register additional annotations, implement new methods, implement new interfaces, and what have you. What the J molecules byte buddy plugin does to byte buddy is that it inspects the class path just like uh, Spring Boot does and realizes, oh, um, you have JPA on your class path. There's a class that might be equipped with the J molecules annotations. And if something is an aggregate root, we can actually add the necessary default persistence annotations for you, right? And that allows us, um, for this example, we uh, went ahead, did you see that um, I g again go ahead and add the necessary metadata to the code? So make it part of the type system. And that allows us to get rid of, let me go back. So um, by the pure fact that there's an aggregate root, we don't need these add entity annotations. They're actually in light gray, but the projector doesn't, doesn't do that really well. Uh, so we can get, get rid of the entity annotation and the no arc constructors. Um, we can get rid of the embedded ID because we already know that order is an ID. Uh, we can get rid of the um, relationship mapping and also the same for uh, the default constructor of the order identifier, right? And then, of course, that, that declaration. You, can you also see that um, there's no serializable here anymore, like not explicitly declared. So if we remove these annotations, so if we don't have that explicitly defined, and we trigger a build, then uh, that's what's happening. So the J molecules byte buddy plugin then kind of sees, oh, there is um, um, the the order is an aggregate root, so it needs to be a JPA entity, right? So we just add the annotation, and it needs a default constructor, so we just add that. If you already have that declared. We just back off, right? There is a default constructor, we don't do anything. You have at JPA entity on there, 
we don't do anything. And that kind of just follows for all of the stuff that I, that I just mentioned. Right? Um, so we basically went from this with its holes uh, to something like that. And that I think s looks much more reasonable to for something that, okay, this could be just a, a simple model class and it's still a perfectly valid JPA entity to be persisted, right? And what's also kind of nice is that, did you notice the table annotation and that, that we didn't get rid of that? Um, that's actually the only custom thing that we need, right? Bef in, in, the, in the approach before that, that table annotation was kind of buried under all of these JPA and also a couple of Lombok annotations that, uh, that was needed to actually make this work. But this is the only special thing here that's special, that's special to that class, really, because order is a reserved keyword. So what we do here is basically tell JPA, oh, we need a dedicated um, table name. So it's not, that specialty is not hidden between or, all the, or inside all the boilerplate stuff that we would need. And, uh, but instead, it's kind of standing out as a custom thing that's interesting here. All right, there's one more thing here, one more detail that's kind of um, nice. And um, do you remember when I said uh, originally, when we didn't have these J molecules interfaces added to the code base, we were lacking this conceptual gravity, right? This kind of, we now know that order is an aggregate root. Um, we, we're kind of, or what we have lost in the move to customer ID is that we, um, we do not really know at this point here that this is a reference to a customer, really. I mean, we as humans can probably judge from the customer ID that this is like something that's identifying a customer, so there's probably a customer class, but like technically if we're inspecting that code, um, there's not necessarily a reference or it's not really obvious from just looking at that class. And there's um, um, like a, a workaround for this, right? Like, so we don't really um, can just differentiate the, the two from one another. And there's a way to make that explicit in our code base. Uh, there's an interface called association uh, where you can basically just describe this thing and basically take the customer ID, uh, have an explicit association, uh, which you can then later reuse to actually go to a Spring Data repository, for example, and resolve that association into an into an actual customer. Um, again, this like this association thing is something that's an interface, so we have to teach JPA how to persist that. Um, that's happening, right? So if we find a property in an aggregate that's of type, of type um, association, then we actually generate a class that's a JPA attribute converter um, to uh, and annotate that property pointing to that generated class to to actually make it make it make it work, right? Um, Right. So I um, probably it's probably worth mentioning that. Um, so oh, let, let's let's go with um, with with that first. So on the left, the like, legacy approach, quote unquote, the old world, and we can basically get rid of all of this, yeah. which is is it half the code? I don't know. Um, and what we've done instead is we like used or made our code more expressive by using the pattern language that we uh, that we have established. Um, in our code base directly, right? And it, ha it has both like cognitive purpose and technical as well. These, the interface um, arrangement that we uh, employed there is not something that we came up ourselves. There's a blog post uh, by a guy called John Sullivan uh, who did like, like really great work on like defining these ideas and um, describing that and we basically just kind of um, yeah, rearranged that a bit and, and bundled it up as an as, a, as these, the set of reusable interfaces. Um, right, the, you can find the pointers in these types and annotations as well, right? All right, so this is the like, boilerplate buster, basically. Um, the idea, how much time do we have left? We started at half, right? 16 minutes. 15 minutes, okay, that's fine. Um, the next thing that that's kind of interesting to explore is that if we have all these, um, or all that information put into the code base in the first place, um, we might actually use that information to um, tell architecturally relevant or 
parts of our code base apart from code that is just like supporting code um, uh, and what have you. Um, there is like, if you look at the, um, the documentation space, like software architecture documentation space, you definitely will run into the C4 model by, by Simon Brown. It consists of um, like a four levels of diagrams, context, containers, components, and code, and with every next level kind of zooming in to one part of the former level, right? So context describes the system and its surroundings. Um, the, like, then you take a deeper look into the, into the system, um, looking at the containers it consists of, not meaning Docker containers, but here's a web application, here's a database, here's an email server, or what have you. Uh, that's kind of part of the system. Um, the next level, level three, is uh, components, so logical components, something that you would probably approach with uh, something like Spring Modulus. And then there is the last level is kind of the representation of the code as a diagram. And you can like debate how useful um, the very last is or how useful it is to manually generate it. Because the more right you get in this, in this uh, diagram here, the faster things are going to change, right? So, I mean, you're probably adding classes, modifying classes. Um, and it's all, there's also like a lot of level of detail that you ha kind of have to, to capture. And um, there's a lot of work to keep that, uh, those, um, those diagrams up to date. Unless there's actually a way to generate some of that stuff, right? That might be interesting. And um, there's a, a kind of a, a nice anecdote, actually. Um, I'm involved with the uh, local um, university in my hometown in Dresden. And we're kind of in the third semester, there's a program for the students. They have to go through a software lab to build a web application with Spring Boot, which is a, a funny thing to do if you like have had half a semester of Java, uh, really. But it's kind of interesting. In, in their presentations, they're supposed to present on like the <coughs> software design and what they do. And they usually come up with UML diagrams that are generated from the code base, right? And this is giant wallpapers of like hundreds of classes with no real value whatsoever to someone just looking at those. Right? And the reason for that is that the, the, like the code that's generating those diagrams cannot really tell the important bits from the unimportant bits apart because it's just lacking that information in the code base. It's just, it's just classes, right? I mean, you could go and say, okay, something like a Spring MVC controller or something like a service might be more important than some arbitrary other class. But there's no, no systemic approach behind, here, behind that here. So with the J-Molecules integration, uh, we can actually do that because we have taken the effort to actually express those concepts in, in our class. So whenever we, can, whenever, whenever we can define something, some scope, and this is where the Spring Modulus project that I would uh, recommend you to have a look at, um, if that defines, let's say, a logical module of here's my orders, here's my inventory, uh, what have you, then we can actually use that scope to describe or generate and extract certain parts from the code base because we know what we're looking for, right? Um, who knows about the definition of a, of a component? Like what, should I just shout it out? Front and out. I was, I'm getting at like, okay, a component consists of a provided interface, that's our API. And, and that's the even more important bit, a required interface, right? So we explicitly have to communicate what we kind of need to work. Um, applying component thinking to classes leads to dependency injection and constructor injection, right? The class exposes methods, that's the provided interface, and it declares constructor arguments, which is the required the required interface. So what other components do I need to work? And this is stuff that's all hidden inside the code base, and that we can actually extract. So we can inspect a component, a uh, Spring Modulus module, for the exposed Spring Beans. So classes that form Spring Beans are an interesting, an interesting thing to look at uh, in, in, in your code base. Um, exposed aggregates, right? Aggregates, in, if you follow DDD, are like the, the primary concepts in which you uh, implement state transitions of your, of your code base, implement your business rules. Um, finding aggregates in a code base and just being able to document them is kind of nice. 
And also, if you uh, have like parts of your code base that interact with other parts of your code base, um, the events that a certain part of your code base emits basically become part of the API, right? Because as an implementer of another module, you might be interested in, oh, I want to invoke that service of that other module, or I want to listen to an event of that other module. And that information is nice, and you wouldn't necessarily want to like jump into the code base right away to find these classes. Right? On the required interface side, um, it might be interesting to find out, okay, what other spring beans of a different module um, are you actually even using? Um, there's configuration properties that Spring Boot um, allows you to define, and describing those and externalizing those is, uh, is, a, is a nice thing to have. And the final thing is basically what events are you consuming, right? So uh, what events are you interested in? So in the Spring Modulus project, there is integration with J molecules, which enables us to end up at something like this. This is an HTML rendering of um, an ASCII doctor snippet that is, was generated by inspecting um, or inspecting the, the code base for, and you see that basically here, it's like the Spring components, they are grouped by stereotypes, right? We have services, we have repositories, event listeners, and others. Um, that particular example is just built on top of the spring stereotype annotations, but all the J-Molecules integration or the J-Molecules concepts are kind of detected in there as well. So if you decide for a ports and adapters architecture, you use the ports and adapters um, annotations of the J-Molecules library, you will see those the spring beans grouped by, oh, this is a port, uh, this is an adapter, um, and so on, right? So you basically get your architectural uh, decisions reflected in, in the documentation. Um, the same for aggregate routes. Um, we find, can basically just find them uh, based on the, on the annotations or interfaces that, we've, that, we've just, uh, that you've just seen. Uh, events is even more interesting because um, the listening e or listening to events is kind of easy to find, right? We just need to find spring annotated methods or annotated methods with uh, springs ev at event listener method. Um, that's kind of the interesting or, or easy part. Published events is a bit more tricky and that works um, via the uh, J molecules uh, domain event interface. So if you let the classes implement this interface, we can actually find them. That's the first, uh, the first step. And RQUnit, that library that analyzes the code, allows us to even um, report where that event actually gets published. Right? So that's kind of, uh, kind of nice. And you see that like some of these um, entries here, these bullet point items, are in uh, like circle. Basically, uh, there's a border around them. Um, if you you can tell that um, documentation system to uh, where that Java doc for that particular code base lives. We can basically just link to the Java doc and you get some kind of nice, um, um, yeah, kind of entry point into okay, what does the module do? And um, we, can, we can actually get, um, you can kind of make the next step into, into some more detail. All right, the way that you would um, extend your, do you remember that class that was, was checking the rules? You can just go ahead and write another test case that basically takes um, a, that application class. Um, there's an API called new documenter, nothing, nothing fancy. Um, it just allows you to uh, pipe in two um, options um, instances. One is for um, some UML diagrams and or C4 model diagrams that we can actually also generate from the, uh, from the module structure that you, that you have uh, created. Um, and the other one, canvas options, is for the application module canvas that you've, that you've just seen. Um, yeah, basically tweaks and options of what to include, what not to include, what have you. All right, so the final thing um, that I just want to like, point you to is that um, now that we have embedded that code into, or these concepts in our code base, then uh, we could also let IDEs actually leverage that, right? So there is a prototype IntelliJ plugin that would uh, decorate your uh, project or th that Explorer view here, uh, extracting the, the role that you have assigned uh, to individual classes in the, in the packages. There's also a different view that basically uses the stereotypes as a grouping element. Um, that plugin 
it hasn't escaped prototype status yet. So if, if someone is interested in like or in IntelliJ plugin development, uh, I'd be highly interested to get in touch with you uh, because you of course would want to like you just use one over the other, right? Because like having like two views uh, doing the same is kind of a bit weird. But I didn't have too much time yet to go into like oh, how to add an option there to in the settings for IntelliJ. But um, yeah, a, a space to explore. Same exists for. Um, for uh, Eclipse, basically, there's a j dedicated J Molecules Explorer. That's that's in there, right? So what I what I want you to take away from this session is that um, there is value in expressing the architectural and design concepts that you basically have um, in your code base, um, and there's a lot of benefit that you can draw from doing so by using all that technology integration. Um, there is in the in, uh, JMolecules integrations, there's a couple of libraries that you can add to your class path, and that will make um, there's a bit of a, a s I think they call it a so what feature. Have you heard of a so what feature? A so what feature if, is, is if, if stuff works, everyone is like, hmm, okay. But if not, then everyone is going crazy, right? Um, I think it's taken from a, a, like a talk about like someone describing the, some moon landing or something. Bringing astronauts back from space is like, yeah, okay, but if you don't, then uh, that's a, quite a, a critical thing. But what I'm trying to get to is that there's a lot of like integration, tiny integration for, um, for uh, that make these types um, work better in integrating with Spring or Jackson. For example, with, uh, with Jackson, if you have like these single property value types, right, like an email address, and you want to serialize them to Jackson, they become nested objects in the JSON, which is kind of ugly. I don't want like an email address and then a nested object. I want just that, value, that string value over there. Um, there is uh, integration that if something is a J molecules value object and it has a single property, it will automatically get properly serialized. So uh, there's a lot of uh, thought going into how do we make these types work well at the boundaries of your application, both in the serial, uh, serialization space with Jackson and also the um, uh, Spring Data, as I've um, already showed you, that like the JPA annotation generation. That's not only available for JPA, but also for JDBC and MongoDB, right? So you can take that very same uh, model class and would just like persist it to a MongoD MongoDB database. Um, the type conversion from like, let's say um, these identifiers are usually backed by UUIDs, right? So when you serialize an association to a customer, it will basically become an identifier and a primitive object like a string or a UUID. And all of that is kind of taken taken care of. So it's, um, yeah, it's just doing that, a JQ Assistant, argument verification. That's the space as it is right now. But um, the fundamental idea is that we can basically build all this integration on top of the types and annotations that are part of this library and that doesn't have to depend on Spring as a framework in the first place. Um, but we actually equip Spring in a way that it actually works well with, with, these, with these annotations. Right? So, explicit concepts in code, understandable, um, f conceptual gravity is the, is the key word here. Um, that enables you to verify your code base against the, the rules that are attached to these intentional design elements. Uh, we can extract documentation and generate a lot of boilerplate code. Um, there's a couple of resources I want to leave you with. Uh, the project home, just a tiny post space in case you just want to go there. Uh, the examples, there's like code examples for all of the stuff that I've shown you in the X molecules, J molecules example. Um, there's a Gitter. Uh, chat uh, on on the X molecule stuff, and if you're interested in the resources um, that is like that, I've basically consulted to bring all this together, especially the two in the bottom on understandability. The uh, Emin Eden Rick Kasman paper uh, is kind of interesting as well, and a couple of shoutouts to all the people that are involved in this that helped me with like ArcUnit, Byte Buddy, Raphael. Um, that's kind of, and yeah, if you have if you have ideas or uh, want to contribute to especially the IDE plugins, I'd be uh, happy to to talk. <laughs>
Uh, with that, um, thank you very much for your attention. I'll be around the entire day if you have any questions. Short guy with a hat, that's me. Um, all right, thank you.